Hey, and thank you for joining Kolu Math on our second foray into probability. I'm Mr. Kolu, and I'll be taking you through it. All right, so we're going to be looking at compound probability today. And compound probability is what happens when you do a probability experiment more than once. Okay? Um, let's take a look at that in an example. Okay, so let's start with our candy beans over here. And uh, let's put them in a sack. Shake it up really good. And uh, let's do kind of a simple warm-up problem here to get you going. Let's find out what the probability is of drawing one green jelly bean. Okay, pretty simple. And remember, we have three green jelly beans here. One, two, three. And uh, let's check out that uh, fun-to-use fraction we have. How many things will make you happy over total number of things? So in this case, three jelly beans would make us happy. And we have a total of ten jelly beans. Nice and easy, that gives us a probability of 3 over 10, or 30%. Well, let's check out the type of problem we'll be looking at today. What is the probability now of drawing two green jelly beans in a row? Okay, so let's, uh, let's start thinking about this. And we'll begin with this question. How many times are you repeating this test, or how many trials are we having here? Well, since we're trying to draw two beans in a row, we have two separate trials. In the first trial, we have the bag with 10 beans, 3 green, and we're going to, uh, hmm, have the same bag? Oh boy, uh, that doesn't, well, does that make sense? Let's, uh, let's think about this. So in trial 1, we've got these 10 beans in the bag here, and we're going to remove one. Hopefully it's green. Um, and then when we start our second trial, we're actually going to be starting with that very same bag. We're not going to have a fresh bag to begin with. Uh, we're going to be using the same one. And now the situation has changed. If you can tell, there's only two green jelly beans now, and we have a total of nine jelly beans. So our fraction is going to change. The situation has changed there in our two different trials. So on our first trial, we have the full bag with ten beans and uh, three green ones. But after we remove one of those beans, we'll only have two green beans, and a total of nine. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, excuse me, uh, hold up a minute, sir. Uh, yeah, Joe, um, what's going on? Uh, do you remember how you said that on the first draw we took out a green bean? Uh, yeah, Joe. Well, <laughs> how do we know that we picked a green in the first trial? Joe, that's actually a really good question. Um, when we calculate compound probability, we always assume that the trials were successful. Because that's what we're looking for, is what would happen if we did it correctly two times in a row. We could calculate it, the probability of not getting a green, but that's a different problem maybe for a different video. But just remember, when you're calculating compound probability, uh, you assume that the trials are successful. So in the first trial, we have three green beans, a three out of ten chance. And on the second trial, one of those beans is already left, so we have a two out of nine chance. So what exactly does that mean? Well, let's take a look at a simpler example and see how it lines up. Ah, our favorite pastime, flipping quarters and calculating the probabilities. Well, in this case, we're going to be flipping this quarter twice. So on our first flip, we have two possible outcomes, getting a heads or getting a tails. And if we had gotten a heads on our first trial, we have two possible outcomes of getting a heads again or getting a tails. And... Had we gotten a tails on the first trial, we have the possibilities of getting either a heads or a second tails. So actually, when we look at it, there are four possible outcomes for these experiments. Let's take a look at them in another way that's maybe a bit easier to understand. So if we put the results in a chart, we can see that we have one possibility of getting two heads in a row, a second possibility of getting one heads and then a tails, a third possibility of getting a tails and then a heads, and then finally a fourth possibility of getting two tails in the row. So if we do an experiment by flipping a coin twice, there are four possible outcomes. So if we're focusing on possibility one, getting two heads in a row, we have a one-fourth chance of getting that, and that's as likely as any of the other possible outcomes. Let's take a look at the numbers behind there and see if we can figure out how to get one-fourth. Well, if we're trying to get two heads in the row, that means we need to get a heads on the first trial, which is a one-half chance. We also have a one-half chance of not getting a heads, getting a tails. But right now we're focusing on getting a heads. Okay, 
We have a one-half chance of getting a heads in the first trial and a one-half chance of getting a heads in the second trial. So that gives us these two uh, probabilities here, one-half and one-half. And how do we relate those two numbers together to get a one-fourth? Uh, I think you've gotten it right. We're going to multiply. And if we multiply one-half times one-half, we get one-fourth. So that's what we do with our probabilities here. If we know we have a 3 out of 10 chance on the first trial and a 2 out of 9 chance on the second trial, we can simply multiply those two probabilities together. We get 6 out of 90 or 1 out of 15, okay? Which is a pretty small chance. Think about that. If you had 10 beans in a bag and you were trying to get 2 from a pile of 3 uh, within that bag of 10, uh, there would be a very small chance of getting those at random. You're much more likely to get a red or a yellow in there by accident. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Pretend that you and your friend are at the fair and they're having a raffle, and in fact, um, you notice that there's not very many tickets in the drum there, and uh, you and your friend both enter. There's eight total tickets, two of which, um, one belongs to your friend and one belongs to you, and they're actually doing two drawings in a row here. And we want to know what is the probability of both you and your friend winning. First question we want to ask is how many times are we repeating this test or how many trials do we have here? In this case, since there's two drawings, we're going to have two trials. Let's take a look. Trial one, we have all eight tickets. Both you and your friends are still there. So that gives us a two because there's two tickets that'll make us happy out of an eight total amount of tickets. And once one of those tickets is removed, because we're assuming that the trial was successful, seven total tickets now and one of those, which is a winner for us. So now we have two fractions, 2 over 8, 1 over 7. We'll go ahead and combine them. So 2 over 8 times 1 over 7 gives you 2 over 56, or 1 over 28. Um, still pretty rare odds of both you and your friends winning in a, uh, even such a small raffle. Try the calculation with 800 total tickets, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, let's take a look at this example here. I'm sure you're all familiar with spinners. And uh, the question we're going to ask today is, what is the probability of spinning a number greater than 4 twice in a row? Okay. So we actually have two numbers here that are greater than 4. We have 5 and we have 6. And since we're going to be spinning the spinner twice, we have two trials. So on spinner 1, I'm going to spin the spinner and hypothetically land on either 5 or 6. One of those will be removed. And uh, we'll get over to trial two and we'll spin. And now since there's only one that will make us happy out of five total wedges, we'll take those two numbers and multiply them together. Wait a minute. Does this make sense? Is that the way a spinner works? When you spin a spinner and it lands on a number, do you lose that option for the next round? No, actually. No matter how many times I spin a spinner, I'm always going to have the same number of possible outcomes. And if I'm looking for specific results, I'm always going to have that same amount of specific results. Remember, no matter how many times you spin a spinner, or roll a dice, or flip a coin, it will always have the same number of possible outcomes. So what's the difference here? On the left hand, we've got these spinners that don't ever change, no matter how many times we repeat the experiment. And then we have something like a bag of jelly beans on the right hand side that does change every time we do an experiment. In fact, might drastically change, depending on how many times we do an experiment. Well, those two things are called events, and we can define them as being either independent or dependent. Independent events are when the outcome of the event does not influence the outcome of a second event. So again, flipping a coin, spinning a spinner, rolling a dice, no matter how many times we repeat those experiments, the situation is always going to be the same. However, with dependent events, the outcome of one event does influence the second event. So for example, drawing cards or picking from a bag. And that only works when drawn items are not returned. So a question you'll want to ask yourself when solving for compound probability is does it depend what happens the first time? If the answer is no, then the events are independent. If the answer is yes, then the events are dependent. It depends what happens. So let's go back to our spinner problem. The spinner used in the second trial is exactly the same as the spinner used in the first trial. 
No matter how many times you spin it, it will always have the same number of outcomes. That two wedges greater than the number four out of six total wedges is the same probability we have for the second trial. So, as you'd probably expect, we take the two fractions and we multiply them together. And this would be true if we did three trials, five trials, or a hundred trials. Two over six times two over six gives us four over 36, which we can reduce to one over nine. Oh, wow. Uh, looks like we've got another one of these stretch it questions. Well, okay, let's take a look at it. That gentleman you're seeing in front of you there, that young man there, is uh, Bobby Fischer. And uh, Bobby Fischer is well known for being one of the finest uh, chess players ever in the history. Some say he's the greatest ever. And when young Bobby Fischer was just 14 years old, he was in the finals of uh, actually eight different U.S. championship chess matches. He got into the final round of eight different ones. And uh, we want to calculate here, what is the probability that Bobby wins all eight of those null matches? So we have a, probably a one-half chance of winning because he's just got to play one round against one guy. So he's either the winner or he's not. And I guess we could take all those numbers and multiply them together, and that gives us one over 256, a very small chance. <laughs> no, no I, I hope you guys picked up on that there. Uh, actually, we wouldn't do that because, believe it or not, Fisher, the guy there on the left there with the big grin, was actually a genius and a, uh, an expert in chess. In fact, he, uh, at 14 years old, won all eight of those championships. Because remember, chess is not a game of random chance. It's a game of skill. And probability only works for random games of chance, not for games of skill or ability. Okay? Just remember that. All right, you guys, uh, thanks so much for coming again. And uh, we'll see you next time for our next adventure into the world of mathematics. Good luck, guys.